we we are recording right got it well hi everybody i'm the host for tonight i'm victoria meyer i'm one of the directors of the westland community garden and uh shoot gardening has been in my family for generations so it makes me happy to to be part of this tonight i'd like to present priscilla robinson who is a clackamas county master gardener um that's really impressive just to start with i love that and um in her notes i saw that uh she has reason to be proud that all of her children and grandchildren are also avid gardeners so with that i'd like to turn it over to priscilla i will oh no i'm sorry i will be monitoring the chat line so if you have any questions please just put them in the chat and i'll we'll look at them when she finishes with her presentation yeah, it's always best if we can just hold off on questions. So while you're watching, uh, either put them in the chat box or jot them down on uh, a piece of paper or and we can ask, ask them live. So however you want to do that, but it's good to wait until the end. So I'm Priscilla and today I'm going to be sharing some information and hopefully inspiration for your urban vegetable garden. And today's class is a 10 minute university presentation from the Clackamas County Master Gardener Association in collaboration with and in support of the OSU Extension Service Master Gardener Program. And as Victoria mentioned, questions should go in the Q&A oh, into the chat box and we'll take care of those at the end. And uh, I hope you enjoy today's presentation. So I'm curious what your motivation is. Is your motivation to embrace the practices and uphold sustainability pillars? Like, or do you wanna just bring joy to your family with worthwhile tasks and yummy vegetables? Do you wanna take control and grow just organic vegetables? Whether this is gonna be your first vegetable garden or you're looking to improve your skills, motivation is what will sustain you and your garden this year. And my goal is to help you be successful whatever your gardening experience is. And here are the topics we're going to cover today. My lens today is gonna to try and gear in on gardening in an urban setting and those sustainability pillars. And um, with some planning and science-based guidance, we hope your gardening will be fruitful. So let's uh, take a look at the, this step-by-step. Step. So step one is identify those gardening practices to uphold sustainability pillars, environmental, economic, and social. And I have the feeling that I'm kind of preaching to the choir out there, with when it comes to sustainability, but let's take a look and see how those intersections work with an urban garden. So urban gardening is a shift from a traditional garden site. We are accustomed to flowers around a house, but what about vegetables? Um, when I think about the first urban gardens, I think about those victory gardens that rose to fame during World War II. Those victory gardens sprang up in front yards, backyards, balconies, rooftops, patios, and even in the nearby parks. And the number of urban gardens has soared here in the United States since the COVID-19 pandemic has climbed and people were home more. They were looking for something to do. The intersections are amazing. And the need and the want to get back to basics and provide food and positive distractions in a precarious world. My three children and grandchildren all embrace urban gardening with a variety of strategies. And the victory is our growing abilities to enjoy and produce delicious, fresh veggies for our families. So urban gardens contribute to reduce our carbon footprint. Transportation of vegetables and the packaging are very wasteful. Urban gardens are beautiful green spaces, an oasis in cities, communities, and in our yards. 
urban gardens maximize the use of natural resources. If you include rain barrels, that helps you to utilize water when we need it in the summer. By adding mulch to your garden, you can help retain moisture in your soil and reduce your water usage. That's a smart option. And you know, some crops are very well done, dry farmed tomatoes. If you can get them going and then dry farm them, you're gonna have the most flavorful tomato you've ever had. Uh, urban gardens limit soil depletion when you're adding your own compost or when you're rotating crops yearly. Alternate propagation methods like using soil blocks actually improve plant health and germination, and it diminishes the need for plastic pots. My granddaughter, Emma, is always up for filling a cardboard egg carton with seedling mix and some seeds, any seeds. Use resources that you have. Some examples of what I do is if I have plastic milk jugs, I can create them into cloches and place them over young seedlings to protect them from the weather and little critters. I can fill them with water. I call them babysitters. I put them next to my tomato plants when the tomato plants go out early in this, you know, after Mother's Day. And during the day, they absorb heat from the sun. And then in the evening, when the weather cools down or the evening cools down, that radiant heat helps the tomato plants to with, with a little heating source mm. and it helps them to be really useful. Um, even those blasted clam shells that some veggies and fruits come in can be repurposed. And I put them over the tops of my pots when I'm starting seeds. Uh, they act like a little greenhouse and help to keep the moisture in, allow the sunlight in, and I feel good about repurposing them. And a uh, five gallon bucket that, you know, paint comes in when washed out well, and some holes um, drilled into them, they are excellent containers for large patio plants. Um, repurpose what you have for the good garden and maximize all the resources. Measuring and creating seed tape, planting and harvesting help families to make real world connections while also supplementing them with homegrown vegetables. And the ability to grow and produce one's own food improves person's mental health and emotional state of well being and self efficacy. Not to mention the physical benefits of moving and stretching in the gardening process. Let's, let's call it uh, horticulture therapy. The so step two, develop knowledge to gardening options in an urban setting. Gardening options in an urban setting come in all shapes and sizes. You can go vertical, you can go long, narrow, just use your imagination with the space you have. Urban garden options are practical. They're efficient and sometimes even whimsical. Uh, the kits for raised beds and horse troughs have become very popular for a quick raised bed or container garden. Containers, window boxes, raised beds in a community garden or in your yard are all opportunities for an urban vegetable garden. A limiting factor may be the CCNRs for your neighborhood. So always double check what those are before you rip out your front lawn and add your vegetable beds. That's not a joke. <laughs> Determine the size and the location of your garden or your container. The location matters. Vegetables do need six to eight hours of sunlight. And during this time, they are absorbing energy from the sun, CO2 from the air, and water and nutrients from the soils all to grow. Not to mention 
sunlight, not in, or, excuse me, not enough sunlight will weaken your crops, no matter how much care you give them. And so to find the best location, if you're just starting out, is to observe how the sun and the shadows move in your yard. Where are your sunny locations? Where are your shady locations? Identify where vegetables will get the most sunlight. So the amount of sunny space in your yard will be a limiting factor for your garden. The other limiting factor is the time you have to work in the garden each week. If your goal is to supplement your trips to the market, then you're gonna want some substantial space. Um, for each 100 square feet, plan to spend four to six hours working in the garden. That would include cultivation and planting and just making observations. And then another 30 minutes per watering session per week. So there's a lot of time, but remember that a well-tended small garden produces much more than a large neglected garden. So please start simple and then expand. Sometimes the orientation of the bed will be dictated by the space you have to grow in. In the picture on the left, my daughter and son-in-law designed and built planters behind the garage where they had a nice 10 by 20 foot of unused property at their home in North Seattle in the city. The north-south orientation worked out well enough to give them a good six hours of sunlight and those elevated planters overcame the shadows cast by fences and the building. The cage structure keeps out the neighborhood cats and even sometimes the squirrels. In the picture on the right, my community garden is laid out in a nice east-west orientation. And the taller plants in the trellises and in the cages are set on the north side to allow the south side full exposure for sunlight. That's where I put my lower growing plants. No matter what the size or where you're gonna put it, it is good to come up with a plan. And this particular picture came off of one of the seed catalogs. They actually have a nice little um, uh, schematic that you can use. You put in how big your garden's gonna be, uh, how big your, your walkways are gonna be and what plants you wanna put it in, in it. And it kind of helps you figure it all out. So developing a plan is really important. So the first step is decide on the overall space you have for your garden, then divide it into garden, bed space and walkways. The walkways do need to be at least 18 inches wide for kneeling and working in the garden beds. And if you plan to use a wheelbarrow or if you need to use a walker or a wheelchair, you're gonna to wanna to plan wider walkways, like 30 inches, 36 inches wide, even bigger. And cultural needs or cultural practice refers to how you care for your plants. So when you're planning your garden, you might want to plant the plants that have the same needs together. That way, when you water that section, they get all the water and nutrients that they need. Uh, you can also plant them by um, families, plant families, and that also helps with cultural practices and crop rotation. And then another thing you need to think about when you're planning is that some vegetables you're going to put in the ground once, and then they're going to grow all summer and you're going to harvest squash or tomatoes or other vegetables off that. Other plants really benefit from what we call succession planting. It's a system that allows you to rotate in cool crops early in the spring and then replace them with warmer weather. So in my garden, I would have my snap peas in for the cool crop. And then as they stop producing because it's getting too hot, 
I rip off down the pea plants and I plant some nice established cucumber starts. And then they grow up that same fence. They grow vertically. And that allows for um, a good usage of my small gardening space. Mm -hmm. And succession planting works really well with herbs or leafy vegetables like lettuce and spinach. And I like to plant just a few every two to three weeks. That way I'm constantly having a nice crop of leafy greens. Don't have to worry about them bolting. I just eat them nice and young and keep planting. So containers can be both beautiful and delicious. On the left, the gray pots look great together. And look how the steps on the deck are allowing that squash to wander down and have plenty of space. I really like how the um, burgundy chard is paired with those yellow flowers. It's just a gorgeous combination. And how about the obelisk? That just adds an element of design out on the back deck. So, you know, people will look back there and it just looks like amazing plants, not necessarily that you're growing your food. On the right, both the gray and the black pots create a nice neutral palette that emphasizes the beauty of the flowers and the vegetables. So it's really dual purpose landscaping, a variety of leafy greens, gorgeous herbs, just ready to pick. The lettuce can be picked either by the head or by removing the outer leaves, depending on your needs. But it's really important when they're planted so close like this that you want to harvest a head of lettuce by gently cutting at the base of the head with a knife, a nice sharp knife. If you pulled it up, you would disrupt and possibly kill the plants that are nearby. So just be really careful when you're harvesting. So step four is to identify tools and materials needed for your gardening tasks. And I love gardening tools. And when I moved to a condo a few years ago, it meant moving my garden into the community garden plot. And my tools changed, but my love of gardening didn't. The new plot is raised five by 10 feet. And in the first year or so, I used my simple hand tools and just a watering can. I got out there, I really just enjoyed learning how to work in this new space. And that might be something that you need to do. But as my skills and my goals grew, so did my collection of gardening tools. And then in the following years, I put in soaker hoses with a timer to ensure consistent and efficient watering, which also became a time saver. And with that extra time, I rented another garden bed <laughs> and grew more vegetables. And now I give vegetables on a regular basis to my local food bank. And that feels really good, kind of filling one of my, my buckets. And there's no doubt that there's always another tool that will do a better job or make that task a little bit more. But I, I don't want to be wasteful and have a tool that is not easy to store and takes up a lot of space. And I just don't want to be wasteful. So I have a community of gardening friends and sometimes I borrow some of those tools. And so, you know, that might be something that you look at. At any rate, don't let tools be a limiting factor as you begin this journey in gardening. Start with the basics and start as your, and um, build as your skills build and keep your motivation and your vision moving forward. And smaller jobs need the right tools too. The hand trowel, I use that all the time. And here it's being shown to dig holes, to transfer young plants, and also just to plant seeds. I really like to use a watering wand to direct the volume and velocity of the water. That consistent deep root delivery of water is really crucial. And pictured in the middle is my son Everett and his two-year-old daughter, my granddaughter, Eliana, and she loved it. It was a hot day and she just enjoyed 
working with the water and she learned so much. So weeding, probably not everyone's favorite task, but it's really crucial, especially in the first 30 days after planting seeds or young starts. It's really important to dig out those weeds because tender seedlings do not compete very well with weeds. Weeds have got it down. So give them a break. Um, probably one of my favorite weeding tools is my Hori Hori, which is like this big giant knife. And it really will get down and dig out those tough weeds. But it's also very gentle because it's sharp. So it goes in where you want it to go. Um, so remember, if you're weeding near tender seedlings, use tools with care so that you don't disturb the developing root system. Um, and tools also help to protect plants when you're harvesting. Don't just be pulling your plant, you know, the, the, the tomatoes off the plant or yanking on the squash. You're, you're going to destroy branches and stems and, and cut down on your productivity. So harvesting is a really exciting time and using scissors to snip out the greens instead of just your fingernails or using a pruner to gently cut stems. By using that proper tool, your tasks are easier and you protect your plant. And this year, my granddaughter turned seven, so Katie was allowed to use my sharp pruner to harvest the tomatoes. And together, you know, with adult supervision, she felt really good and filled the basket with tomatoes. And that evening, she appreciated that farm fresh vine ripened flavor. I guess you're getting the picture that I really enjoy gardening with my friends and with my family. It's really strong motivation for me. Uh, step five is to determine which vegetables and plants to grow in this space. And this alone could be like a three hour seminar. So I've tried to trim it down. Um, you know, what are the best plants to grow? And I think the first answer is, you know, eat what you, uh, grow what you like to eat. And so I love to eat crisp snap peas and warm cherry tomatoes right off the vines, right off the plant. And so they're the best plants for me to grow. So what would be the best ones for you? Maybe something that your family already likes or something that's interesting for the kids to watch grow. It's really an opportunity for, to try new vegetables or maybe even like those uh, fancy ones at the farmer's markets. It's a fine time to experience and learn how different vegetables grow, root vegetables, climbing beans, wandering pumpkin vines, or how about the plant life cycle from seed to plant, to flower, to fruit, to seed. It's a cycle. What an opportunity for an academic growth. What are the best plants to grow? Well, how much space do you have? That's important. Some plants can grow in a small space and in a shallow depth. Other plants will wander when it sink their roots in real deep or reach for the sky. So information on the back of seed packets or a plant tag will help you. And if your garden space does not get those six hours of sun, then you're gonna really wanna grow nice leafy vegetables. There's lots of choices and they'll do okay in your space. And then what makes good economic sense? Well, I like to grow the vegetables that are most expensive at the farmer's market and the ones that taste best fresh from the plant. So quality production space, quality production space, and value were guiding questions for a study done by Washington State University. That's what this chart is all about. And they compared a variety of crop, crops for three attributes. And they wanted to help home gardeners get the most out of their gardens and their space. So I thought it was perfect for this uh, talk. This study may help you decide which crops make sense for taste, how much space you have, 
and the monetary return for your efforts. So for example, I've highlighted Edenami in yellow and it scored high for quality, meaning that homegrown quality really make a difference. Medium for space, how much space it takes and you can grow those nice and vertically and high for economic value. If that's a vegetable that you might wanna eat based on the data, it makes sense to grow. On the other hand, potatoes highlighted in the pink were scored low for quality, medium for space and low for economic value. I mean, you can buy a bag of potatoes for $1.50 or, you know, $1.50, five pounds. So what's your, what's your return on your effort? So when choosing vegetables to grow, this chart might be helpful. But I felt like something was missing when it came to this talk, sustainability. From a sustainable perspective, you could research the crops that require the greatest amount of transportation or perhaps uh, refrigeration. That is going to be a, a big carbon footprint. Um, and then you might wanna grow those crops instead of buying them from the, uh, the, the supermarket. Um, you could also grow organically and reduce pesticides, and that would call, have a positive impact on our environment. And some think that it's called the dirty dozen, you know, some vegetables and fruits take a lot of pesticides if they're not grown organically to grow. So maybe you want to grow one of those in the, the dirty dozen. You also want to think about how are farmers being treated for the amount of work and their farm workers and um, perhaps boycott fruits and vegetables that exhi exhibit unfair labor practices for their farmers. So quality, production space, value, and sustainability are all pillars and factors that will ultimately help you to guide your growing choices. And an herb garden is a great starting place for beginners, for a chef, and it's an excellent money saver. They can grow easily in a container or be gro grown in the ground. And ounce for ounce, herbs are one of the most economically sound crops to grow. These were planted from starts purchased at a garden center. Having a pot of herbs can be really rewarding as they create interest on a deck, often fragrant, and provide culinary delight, fresh or dried. And many herbs such as thyme, rosemary, sage, and oregano may winter over in the Willamette Valley. So salon and cilantro can self seed by dropping its seeds and then planting the next generation. So a lot of times a, an herb pot will be sustained from year to year with care. So seeds versus starts, the simple answer is to grow both. And an important detail that you wanna look for either on packets or on uh, plant tags is the days to harvest. And that is from putting it in the ground until you're going to get your first vegetable off of that plant. So you'll wanna find varieties that have shorter numbers of days due to our climate and growing season. Um, some plants will do better when you just sow them into the ground. Other plants do better as a start. And if you're not familiar with what a start is, it is a young plant that has gotten a number of leaves. It's gotten its initial leaves and then more leaves. It can be either grown at home or in a commercial greenhouse. But you want those true leaves to be nice and strong, showing lots of potential. And uh, let's see, the advantages of putting starts in the ground is, well, it's instant gratification for one thing, <laughs> <laughs> uh, not having to wait for the seeds to come up. But they also sort of have more of a fighting chance against, against pests if properly cared for. And um, let's see. 
starts are best for your long season crops um, be, so that they get those adequate number of days to include harvesting of the vegetables. Like what's the point? <laughs> Warm crops such, such as tomatoes, tomatillos, hot peppers, bell peppers, squash, and eggplant should definitely go into the garden as a nice healthy start after Mother's Day. That's when we are, will hopefully not have any more frosts. So plan before you buy. There was a really good article in the Oregonian this uh, past weekend on seeds. And yeah, you get to the seed wall and you know your eyes just go gaga, all the possibilities. But it's really important to sort of come up with a plan for your garden before you do that. Um, I get the itch for starting my garden as soon as my Christmas decorations are down and the seed catalogs start rolling in. Uh, seeds are available for sale from retail stores, catalogs, online vendors. Seeds are also available at seed sharing libraries and from your other gardening friends. Uh, in fact, I think West Lynn has a seed library where you can come and get seeds for free for the home gardener. Sandy Library has a very extensive um, seed library and as does the Milwaukee Library. So those are all options because who needs a whole packet of zucchini seeds? I grow two zucchini plants in my, both my garden beds. So if you only need a few seeds, going to a seed library is a really, good way to not be wasteful and be frugal. But at any point, it can be very overwhelming. Sometimes I ask fellow gardeners what's been working for them in their garden. So I want to plant something that I know is going to be successful. So look around. My father always, he was an avid gardener and he would take me on walks to other community gardens I don't know why they're growing that. It's not going to work anyway, you know, and it's true. It wasn't going to work in the sandy, sandy soil up on uh, Cape Cod. So, you know, think about what's working for other gardeners. And lastly, the catalogs and those online sites actually have lots of enticing but important information. They, they've done studies. So, you know, use those resources so that you can be um, most successful. As I said, seed packets and plant labels are a good start for planting information, but they tend to be rather generic. Some of them are published for the entire country. Can you find the Willamette Valley on that little map on the back of the packet? <laughs> so uh, charts. I use a lot of charts that, and they guide me and help me to plan my vegetable garden throughout the year. And this particular chart was um, given to me as an intern for my master gardener training. And it's geared towards the Willamette Valley. So it's, it's gonna work for us. The chart guides you month by month, what can be planted outdoors, what should be started indoors at a certain time, and what can even be grown over the winter. And I find starting seeds indoors is really fun and makes spring arrive all that much faster. This chart is actually two-sided and it's divided into two categories, cool crops and warm crops. And it includes lots of data on soil and air temperatures that are necessary for germination of the different seeds. So you can see each of the charts provides different kinds of information at my fingertips for planning purposes. And in case you're tuning in from outside of the Willamette Valley, this chart also includes additional regions in Oregon. So you could share this with friends who, who aren't just right in our uh, neck of the woods. So here in Oregon, planting seeds directly outdoors can start as early as February. The soil temperature is the determining factor that triggers seeds to germinate and grow. Some like it cool, some like it warm. Uh, refer to the seed labels or the charts. 
And I always use my seed, my uh, soil thermometer. I actually monitor the temperature of my soil um, at least once or twice a week when I go over to the garden. It's a good thing to have. Um, I like to keep charts handy so that I can refer to them. And did you know that seeds from previous planting seasons that have been stored properly may still be viable for years, um, even if it's past the date on the back of your seed packet. So you can conduct uh, germination tests on those seeds for viability and reduce waste. Here's an example of cool season seeds that will germinate in lower soil temperatures and plants that will grow best in the cooler air in the fall, spring in the fall. Lettuce, kale, spinach will actually germinate at 35 degrees and they look amazing in planter boxes and containers. I often use them as my filler. Warm crops need warm soil and air temperatures to germinate. So squash, cucumbers, tomato varieties, now, some of them can do really well in a limited amount of space and do well in a container. I've even put pole beans in a big five gallon container with some bamboo poles to support the vines and the, the developing plant. Uh, corn doesn't do well in a container unless your purpose is to have some really cool looking plants to put out for your fall harvest season. So that's really fun too, but it's not really going to be a successful crop. Uh, in a, in a container, but it really looks cool. And plant selection for containers, um, look for patio varieties. If you're looking at tomatoes, get ones that are determinant. That means they're gonna grow to a certain size, they're gonna flower, they're gonna set fruit, and they're going to um, you know, not get six, seven feet tall. Consider the mature size of a plant when you're putting it in a container, the sun needs, your own personal preferences, and you know, mix it up. Use that brightly colored foliage of the kales and the chards and mix them with your flowers. I think you're gonna be really pleased with your containers. So step six is develop and enrich knowledge for soil preparation, planting care, maintenance, and harvesting. And this is Eliana, who she wants to know what is soil? So soil is a combination of air, water, 5% organic matter. So 25% air, 25% water, 5% organic matter. That always surprises people and 45% mineral particles. Uh, if your soil is really hard and cracked in the summer and soggy and mushy in the winter, there's a good chance that you're one of those lucky Willamette Valley people who have a really high clay amount in your soil. And your yard may be a good, good candidate for raised garden beds or containers with a much more loamy topsoil that can be brought in. Uh, it's highly recommended for gardeners of all experience levels to test for soil pH early in the growing season. It's a chemical thing. Uh, most vegetable plants like soil to be in the neutral range, so 6.2 to 7.5 to absorb the nutrients from the water most efficiently. And guess what? This year, the spring garden fair that's put on by the Clackamas Master Gardeners is returning to the Canby Fairgrounds and we are doing free pH testing on your soil. So grab a scoop of soil from different sections in your garden, throw it all into one bag, bring it out to the fairgrounds and we will test your soil, give you the pH and we'll give you a, a, a head start in what amendments might be needed to be added to your soil so that your plants can do the best they can. Did I say that it was April 30th and May 1st? I don't think I did. That's when you're gonna to wanna to go. Nine to four on Saturday, nine to five on Saturday and nine to four on um, Sunday. Can be uh, fairgrounds. Great. 
So when to start working the soil is important and just do the squeeze test, pick up a handful of soil and squeeze it. On the right is what you're looking for, a healthy loamy garden soil that's loose and crumbly when you open up your hand. On the left, the soil is way too wet. It forms into a ball, it holds its shape. And if you work your soil when it is too wet, you will ruin soil structure. And sometimes you can never get that back. It's really a bad thing. It can cause also compaction, which means that you're not gonna have enough space for roots and water to infiltrate. So sustain the health of your soil is important and do the squeeze test. Uh, commercial potting mixes have organic matter, minerals, and pumice to provide a favorable foundation, and this provides an ideal growing medium to anchor roots. Uh, it's very important if you bring home a bag of that potting mix is before you put it into the pots, you want to so totally saturate it. That might mean putting the hose right in that bag and stirring it around all the way to the bottom or dumping buckets. Yes, buckets of water in there and stirring it up and getting it totally saturated. If you just put it in dry into your pot, you're never going to get that, that good movement of, of uh, water through your pot. Uh, spacing, plant spacing in the garden is really important. Uh, what will be the mature size? These plants that my granddaughter in the tie-dye was picking, she's a three-year-old and those plants are way over her head. They were well over four feet tall. So think about the mature size when you are putting your plants in. Um, if you're short on space, maximize it by growing vertically like peas, beans, cucumbers, squash. They are all great candidates to grow up vert vertically on a trellis. Uh, tiny seeds can be really challenging. So using or making seed tape can make a difference in seed waste and in ease of planting. So my grandkids are really love to make seed tape and um, it works really well. You can also use it for flowers, any seed that is really small and hard to handle. So you have less time thinning out the seedlings saves you time and your plants get a nice healthy start. Okay, and then over on the left-hand side, if you're really trying to think about spacing and you've done one of those garden plans of, you know, um, you can actually just run measure and then run strings across the top of your garden bed and then plant the, the number of plants that need to be in each grid. Um, kids really like this too. So care and maintenance is where you will spend most of your time, and it's referred as cultural path, um, practices. So let's look at watering. So in my household, I try to involve everyone. And on the left, here's Emma when she was just 15 months old, and all she needed was a step stool and an invitation. And then on the right is my sister, Deb, and she was housebound and very ill. Yet she really thrived with the opportunity to care for her containers and vegetables and flowers. And it was something that encouraged her to get out of bed, to get out onto the deck and get some fresh air and get some sun and have some joy. So um, don't ever underestimate those simple joys that the young and get from helping. And again, when you're watering, you wanna really get deep down into the roots. And if you're wondering if it's getting deep enough, you can actually dig very carefully with your trowel or I use my hori hori. I go down six to eight inches and I actually feel, is the water getting down deep enough? It can be surprising and it can vary from garden to garden, container to container, contending, uh, depending on the structure of your soil. So plants need attention and tasks like that keep your garden healthy and producing. Remember the three Ds, trimming off the dead, diseased or dying leaves. That's gonna keep your plants healthy. Clipping off bolting 
blooms on leafy vegetables might extend the leaf of those lettuce or spinach. Thinning plants and the removal of cool crops as the season progresses. On the left, you can see some nice healthy turnips. So when the shoulder or the top of the plant, like this purple, starts to show, they're getting ready to harvest. But which ones are you going to harvest? Well, you have two options here. If you pulled out the one in the yellow triangle, that would pull out that monkey in the middle, and it would give this big turnip more space and resources to grow. And it would give this turnip on the far left more recess resources to grow. If you don't like big turnips and you want nice young ones, then you're definitely gonna to wanna to pull that turnip that's in the blue square because that one is looking like it's ready and look at all those nice turnip grades that go along with it. If crops are true too crowded, you really need to do some thinning because all of the plants will benefit by that thinning. Uh, succession planting means adding more seeds on a regular basis. And on the right, I'm planting beets in some of my homemade seed tape. And it's sort of late in the summer, I've pulled out my uh, cilantro that has been bolting and I've planted beets and those beets will germinate, start growing. And then by fall, before the first frosts, I will have some lovely second set of crops of, of beets. So that's a, a good thing. Uh, if you have plants that are not producing, then take them out and what else can you put in there? You might get a start from a garden center. It's all, it all depends on what you, what you wanna do. So when it comes to fertilizing, too much of a good thing is not good for the environment or your plants. And it's very important uh, to follow instructions on packaging. Nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are the building blocks that work to help grow your plants. Those are the numbers that you see on fertilizer um, bags. Uh, other options are available, adding compost, adding well-aged manure. All of those will add and help the, um, the plants to get the, the food that they need to grow and be productive. Uh, I generally add a balanced um, fertilizer at the beginning of the season. Every couple years, I have my soil evaluated for the components and then use that to amend the soil. Uh, let's see. And then as the growing season progresses, water-soluble fertilizers can be dispensed with uh, with a watering can to deliver specific nutrients for the immediate consumption of developing plants. And notice that different crops want different levels of these building blocks. So, um, you know, when, when someone says, you know, I just put miracle Grow on everything, it's not necessarily the best thing for the different plants. So take a look at this, you know, look at this, breakdown of plants and what they want. And weeds come in lots of shapes and sizes and recognizing them comes with experience and a little detective work. On the right, the intensive gardening of those lettuce leaves really leaves very little room for weeds, but notice in the yellow circle, there's a little clover starting to grow. Uh, this pot of plants that um, Sherry grew was just stunning, a variety of different lettuces, different textures, different colors. I mean, wouldn't that be pretty on a deck? Um, also, some weeds are unwanted volunteers. If you look on the left-hand side, um, that's a lot of cilantro that has reseeded itself. But there's my broccoli trying to grow amidst all of that. So, Instead of just pulling the cilantro and tossing it, I pull the cilantro and I eat it. <laughs> so, um, yeah. 
So sadly, I see a lot of food waste in my community garden and in other community gardens. Beautiful produce ready to be picked, rotting and then rotting on vines or broccoli going to flower. I, I think you get the picture and it makes me sad. So my one big piece of advice is to harvest on a regular basis and reduce food waste. Plus, harvesting on a regular basis really helps your plant. So consistently picking those outer leaves on the Swiss chard, it encourages more plants to grow up from the center. Grow up harvesting the larger eggplants in this container encourages and gives energy to those little small eggplants. So you can see that it's really important to harvest and to urge the plant to continue to grow, produce, and ripen. Uh, plants that grow seed-bearing vegetables like peas, beans, summer squash, eggplant, tomatoes, they need to be picked to keep producing. And when harvesting tomatoes, give them a gentle squeeze. You should feel them give a little bit, and that's when you want to pick your nice, fine, ripened tomato. Each vegetable has its suitable clue that, it, that it's ready to harvest. Um, and you may want baby zucchinis for the grill or a large zucchini to stuff or to grate for zucchini bread. You know, you're the boss of your garden, so harvest it when you want it. And then lastly, using the correct tool when you harvest is really important to preserve the health of the plant in future harvests. Pests come in all shapes and sizes and looking for clues is the first step in integrated pest management. Always identify and monitor problems before acting and consider the least toxic approach. I, I use very little chemicals, if none, really in my gardens. Um, I just try and keep interrupting the cycle of them. Um, if you do uh, have chemicals, uh, these uh, pesticides, please be sure to store them safely away from children and pets. Uh, but, this is interesting. Um, men, in many cases in a vegetable garden, it's not a pest at all. Sometimes it's the cultural practices or what you're doing in the garden that is causing a problem. Weather, like hail, can also be misinterpreted as insect damage. So therefore it's really important to look carefully at your plants on a regular basis for, for signs of specific pests before you use a pesticide. After all, these are your vegetables and you have control to keep them free of chemicals. So if you see holes in a slime trail, well, it's a good possibility that they're slugs or snails. So what could you do? Well, grab your flashlight and go out on a slug hunt in the evening. Those slugs are active in the evenings and they're gonna be looking for the leafy vegetables. You can hand pick them off. There are also slug traps. Uh, also learn about the life cycle of the pests and try to interrupt the offspring that do the most damage. Depending on the size of your garden and the outbreak, physical removal, or just simply squishing the eggs of the cabbage worm will slow down the damaging phase of its life cycle. And white flies can really make a mess in a garden. Physical removal with bursts of water or an herbicidal soap solution can slow them down. Also remove leaves, or sometimes you'll have to remove the entire plant if you have heavy infestation. Mammals and birds do a lot of damage quickly, and I certainly have had a deer wander in and take down the better part of my peas or beans. But barriers and nets are a good defense. And uh, I had birds in the trees overhead this past weekend as I was planting my snap peas and I was diligent to place row cover on my raised bed to give me a fighting chance. So, do you wanna be an urban legend in your own garden? Here's the game plan. 
You want to use careful preparations and consistent care. Choose your garden site, gather your tools, prepare the soil, design, design a garden layout, purchase the starts and seeds, plant your starts and seeds in the garden. Then that care is so important, water regularly, fertilize, remove weeds, check for pests, thin seedlings, harvest regularly, and plant in succession. So please explore the many resources at our 10 Minute University. It's located on our website here, www.cmastergardeners.org. All of the information there is science-based. It's all been vetted and you, it's free. You can print them out, you can just read them. Other resources that I use a lot are also on online and available, Growing Your Own Vegetables, Vegetable Gardening in Oregon. And here on the bottom, that is the uh, chart for looking at homegrown versus, versus store-bought vegetables. Whoopsie, hold on, there we go. <laughs> And then Oregon State University Extension Publications has great resources. You can always um, email Master Gardeners and you will get a personalized reply back. If you send photographs, they'll check them out. If they have more questions, they'll, they'll email you back. It's, it's pretty timely. Also ask an expert is another resource. But um, I was pretty proud of those beets that I grew. Look at those there. They were super tasty. And, um, you know, I get a lot of joy out of gardening. So thanks for joining me tonight. And I'm wondering what questions have germinated. Okay. Um, one of the questions is about a raised bed soil and how often do you need to change it or amend it? Aha. Uh -huh. So um, there's one school of thought that that needs to be changed out every year. Uh, there's also another school of thought where you need to remove all of that soil from the pot. If you've got a large vessel or maybe a wheelbarrow, then you can mix in some uh, compost with that soil or add more potting mm -hmm. soil and just mix it up. What you don't want is compaction. And in a container um, over the course of a growing season, roots will get in there and it will be, you, you'll be surprised when you dump that out. So the, the, the short answer is dump it all out, loosen it up, remove the old uh, roots, mix in some amendments like compost or additional potting soil. Yearly, that's the real short answer. Uh, short and clear. Um, what do you use for homemade seed cake? I love that question. Uh, I'll be doing a um, 10 minute university noontime chat on growing plants from seeds and I will be demonstrating seed tape. But the way we grow seed tape is we use toilet paper. We use Elmer's glue. We use toothpicks. And basically, um, my garden bed is five feet wide, so I make my seed tape about five feet long. I uh, cut the toilet paper into thirds, then fold it, open it up, and then go down the middle, and I just put a dot of glue, whatever the prescribed distance is. And so if I'm planting radishes, that might be two inches apart. So I'll go dot, dot, dot. And then I'll put the seed, 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 and go all the way down. Then I will add additional dots around the perimeter and then just fold that down. Um, when you're using the Elmer's glue and uh, the toilet paper, remember whatever surface you're working on, you're gonna wanna protect. So um, I actually have a long sheet of uh, parchment paper that I only use for making seed tape. And that kind of gives a release so it doesn't stick. And um, once the seed tape is thoroughly dried, then you can roll it up 
either around like a, a toilet paper roll or you can um, just gently fold it up, put it in a plastic bag and then store it in the refrigerator. All right, that's fun. Um, um, I had a question which was in other examples of succession planting. Um, if you have a couple more examples of what is good, good to okay. do. Okay. Um, so I like to start early. I, you know, like I said, I already have my peas in the ground. And um, so we said that we, I put cucumbers like um, lemon cucumbers, they'll grow nicely up that, um, that so other succession ones. Um, anything that's gonna bolt, you know, your early season crops, I'll take out, um, yeah. crops that are bolting and add chard kale that will that'll last through the um through the summer um i can also you know if you put in a nice um any any warm vegetable any warm vegetable you can put take out a cool crop and put in a warm crop um a nice squash plant because those they'll keep um, producing until the, uh, the end of the summer. You don't want to put in something that takes a lot of days to harvest. So you want to have a shorter days to harvest. Right. Um, well, I don't, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think if there's anybody else who has a question, we generally um, finish around now. So um, uh, if, just double check here if anybody has another question. And we can, un can they raise a hand? Um, people are, most folks have their video off. So uh, yes, they should be able to raise hands. That's open. Yeah. So I guess we don't oh, have any more questions. Kim says that, Kim says that her fav one of her favorite tools is her hori hori too, so. Ah, can yeah. you talk about dry farming tomatoes? Do you want me to talk about that a little bit or do we need to go? Do we I, need to go? I think we should, I can, that's my question and I can do some research on that. Okay. So I'm, I'm good with that. Uh, it's been very informative. I thank you so much. Yeah, I hope I touched enough on sustainability. I tried to go down that genre, but um, yeah. So um, I appreciate it. I think we're, we're ready to say good night and uh, thank you very much for your time and your expertise. Well, thank you everyone for your kind comments and thanks for attending and thanks for having me. It was All awesome. Right. All right, thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. So I'll wait until everyone's gone and close us out. Yes. Thanks, Priscilla. Appreciate it. I, I definitely went over. I'm sorry. Not a problem. It's okay. I'm going to, I'm going to end the meeting. All right. Oh, do you have a number for me, Victoria? I think 12. I think, yeah, 12. Well, all right. All awesome. Right. Okay. okay. Well, thank have you. Have a nice for evening, everyone. With you. Thanks for uh, helping to facilitate getting, getting in on, uh, on this. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Good night.